Colleagues, moving on to file item 110. Senate Bill 350, Mr. Secretary, please read. Senate Bill 350 by Senator De Leon and Aquilina Energy. Senator De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Colleagues, in California, we understand that the, th the threat of climate change. We understand the cost of air pollution and how it hurts our children. We understand that we have a responsibility to act, not only for the sake of our planet and future generations, but for the health of our communities today and the health of our economy tomorrow. We are making strides expanding access to clean energy, but still have a lot to work to do in making sure it reaches every Californian, especially those who suffer the most from pollution and who don't have the wherewithal to make this transition. SB 350, Senate Bill 350, will move the largest state in the union with the eighth largest economy in the world to generate half of its electricity from renewable sources by 2030. SB 350 will also double our energy efficiency in all existing buildings by 2030. These will be incredible achievements and we are well on our way. But this measure will put in, sta in place standards to make sure we actually get there. And it puts in place accountability to make sure agencies and businesses work towards these goals in the most effective and equitable manner. The assembly amendments, as you all know, uh, strike out the 50% reduction by 2030 of petroleum used uh, by transportation. This bill is supported by the major state utilities, including environmental groups, organized labor, and a long list of other forward-thinking businesses. The California Ma Manufacturing Technology Association, as well as the National Federation of Individual Businesses or Independent Businesses, as well as the California Chamber of Commerce, are all neutral. This bill is supported by millions of Californians who want their leaders to move us toward a clean energy future. And thanks to our commitments and investments, Californians are breathing cleaner air and saving thousands of dollars each year on their gas and utility bills. Finally, as President Barack Obama recently said in Las Vegas, Nevada, with Senate uh, Leader Mr. Harry Reid, when he recognized California's new 50% renewable goal, a lot of Americans are going solar and becoming more energy efficient, not because they're tree huggers, but because they are cost cutters. Let's make sure California continues to lead the way, and let's make sure we do this together. With that, I respectfully ask and I vote. Thank you. Senator Huff. Thank you, Madam President, members. You know, it was a clever number, SB 350. We should probably call it SB 250 now because we lost one of those 50s. But, you know, to say that some of the opposition has been removed to make it sound like it's a better bill, and it is better, but it's about like a physician saying, well, we can save your arm, so instead of losing two arms and a leg, you're only going to lose an arm and a leg. You feel a lot better. But that doesn't make this a good bill, nor would that be a good diagnosis. On energy efficiency, California has been an absolute leader in making our buildings more efficient. And in certainly in constructing new buildings, that's a lot easier to do with the technology we have now, the building standards. Retrofitting older buildings is very difficult. It's very expensive. But the bill fails to recognize measures that have already been taken to make existing buildings uh, energy efficient. So it calls for a 50% reduction of energy use in our existing buildings, no guidance on how to get there, um, which means we're going to have some unelected people, uh, once again, coming up with standards and things that's going to end up very expensive. Um, many retrofits are extremely expensive, take years to recover the costs. Have the existing programs been cost effective? We, we don't know. But here we're going to go out here and set a, a huge standard. If it was advisory and, and a goal without any club to get there, that would be one thing. But we don't do that very well in the state. The toughest issue still remains uh, is the RPS hitting up to 50 percent in 15 years. We're on a path to reach our 2020 goals, uh, but at a cost, electricity averages over 40 percent higher in California than the national average. That's when you get into industrial, it's over 60% higher. So our business sector is shouldering a huge amount, not just us and the residential. And when businesses pay more for electricity, that means they tend to go in jobs that at least require a lot of electricity to other states. 
and we don't have as many jobs as we could have. And yet, we know that we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation. So we can feel real good about this, but we continue to drive jobs elsewhere when we make our electricity more expensive. Electricity um, is likely to increase with this uh, higher mandate as well. There's an entity called E3 study that estimates on the regular trajectory we have right now with our existing policies, by 2030, our electricity will be 47% higher than it is right now. So that was estimating that from 2012. Since then, we have uh, increased some of our policies that likely dr drove that higher. But we're looking at um, 33 to 50% likely already. It's estimated if we go to 50% renewable, that'll be another 9 to 23% higher. So you add that all up, they're saying within 15 years, we have 75% higher electricity because of our energy policies, which is drives the primary part of that. There are some new thoughts that are coming down the pike about, and they call it uh, energy poverty, because as we have higher costs of electricity, we have over a million of our households that are spending 10% of their budget on electricity. If you're in an inland area, it's 15% of your budget. That's a pretty, pretty big amount being spent on energy, and this will exacerbate that. Um, so this bill adds to problems uh, without much oversight and without the cost benefits. And again, I brought this up before, but where's hydro? We, we have these lofty goals, and yet we put our thumb in the scale and say, let's not do hydro because it's not politically correct, but it is clean energy. You look at Canada, they have clean energy, but it's just about all hydro up there. Um, I'm mindful that California is 1% of our global warming, 1% 1, 1 of greenhouse gases in the world. So we have taken a very strong leadership role in the last 10 years on this issue. And as former Speaker Fabia Nunez, who was the author, although we know Senator Pavley was the real author of that, but uh, he had his name on the bill, he said that he was told that if California took this aggressive step, others would follow, but they didn't. And so we feel real good about this. We feel really good about what we're gonna vote on tonight, and yet 1% of the world's greenhouse gases is not even going to move the needle a statistical blip. But we're gonna be paying, and we are paying already 40% higher, and with this we'll be paying 75% higher in our electricity in 15 mm -hmm. years. So at what cost? As we drive more people into this energy poverty, as we continue to drive jobs out of the state, well, the wind will still blow, the sun will still shine, but it won't always, won't always do it when we need that electricity. I think we need to stick with where we are. Let's get there and figure out how to reclaim some of the jobs we've bled off to other states that have a more aggressive and more cost-effective energy policy, and I urge a no vote. Thank you, sir. Senator Leno. Out of respect for the hour, I will be brief, but this is a historic moment. I can't not say a few words. So proud to be a joint author with Pro Tem de Leon on this historic bill. And for those of us who have been around for a while, you got to recognize that when we first put an RPS in place in year 2000, 15 years ago, Everyone was opposed. Chamber of Commerce was opposed. All the utilities were opposed. And everyone said it couldn't be done. The very concept of it was that by putting an RPS in place, by setting a goal, these new technologies, this new innovative industry would be impacted by an exponential increase in the demand for the technology. And as a result, as markets work, the cost of it would fall equally, ever in greater parity with fossil fuel. It happened. And now renewables are actually less expensive. The model worked. And within a few years, we thought we can do better. And Joe Semidian worked for years. It took a number of years to increase it from 20% to 33%. And some of the naysayers were still there. It can't be done. It's going to kill jobs. Well, guess what? 
The fastest growing market segment in California right now is in renewables. 60% of all venture capital dollars in the United States come to California. The smart money is in California because of decisions that this legislature has made. And this year, because we started big and bold and beyond ambitious with 350s, we're on the floor tonight with not only a 50% RPS, but a doubling of our building's energy efficiency, and there's no opposition to the bill. So while everyone was focused on fuels, we've moved forward with two landmark pieces in our 350. That's astounding, and we can do it, and the chamber is neutral, and the National Federation of Independent Businesses is neutral. All the utilities are in support. We have turned a corner, and we are, oh, oh, no, the world is not only watching what we're doing, they're following what we're doing. Kevin DeLeon, thank you so much for being bold and brave and making sure that we will have done everything within our power to make sure we have a planet to pass on to the next generation because those ice caps are melting faster than anyone had predicted. We've got serious challenges ahead. But for those of us who are supporting this tonight, we can tell those who come after us, we did what we could to save this planet. I ask for an I vote. Senator Anderson. Members, I, uh, I rise in opposition. My, I'm not going to reiterate uh, all the comments my, my colleague from Diamond Bar went through because they were spot on. The one thing that I'd ask that you go through is, is two items. One, so we're pushing really hard on solar, and as people go, on to the, go off the grid and get their own solar, we give no credit for that. So the power companies don't get credit for the solar that individuals sell back to the power companies. And I think that's wrong. I think that's not a fair adjustment to when you're looking at this. That's one issue, but that's not the big pet peeve. I think that if you were to ask most of our constituents, not everybody, but many, many on the lower social economic side, are you better off today than where you were before we started this? Was gas more affordable? Did you have a higher level of living because you could afford to purchase more? Were you better off? And I think that's the key question. Because while these are lofty goals, they've come at a price. They've moved people from the middle class to the lower classes, and people in the lower classes to the unemployed. And I think that's wrong. And in my district, it's very clear. Nobody ever says, oh my gosh, I want to pay higher gas prices to ensure that there's more solar. No one's saying, you know what? I'm willing to cut children's health care and disabled, developmentally disabled, to ensure that we have more electrical charging stations throughout our community so that people who buy $100,000 cars can travel throughout our state. I think they think about, you know what? I want to put bread on the table. I want my kids to go to a safe school, get a better education than I received, and improve their station in life. I want the glass ceiling removed from me. I don't want to be a slave to energy. And yet, these are lofty goals. I don't think anybody disagrees that and in, in, in insists on, on having poor air uh, or air pollution or insisting on water pollution. But I think we need to go into this with our eyes open. And before we say this is a euphoria, I think we need to think long and hard. For those working class in our districts, are they better off today than they were before? Because my phone's rung off the hook. See, I sent out an email and I said, hey, is this something that I should be supporting? I've got great clarity on my vote tonight because my district has spoken loud and clearly. They want jobs, they want opportunities, and they want to live in an affordable society that doesn't hold them down. I urge a no vote.
Madam President and members, I rise in opposition to SB 350. And I'm going to say, I'm going to quote some of the same uh, numbers that my colleague from Diamond Bar did, but I think some of us probably need to hear it twice. I do represent the poorest district in this state and in the country. This measure will lead to substantial increases in the cost of energy in California and will hurt families who live in our most disadvantaged communities. The Manhattan Institute recently reported that one million California households experienced energy poverty. These households spent more than 10% of their disposable income on electricity and natural gas and were disproportionately located in the hotter, less affluent inland counties. The report pointed out that only 3.6% of San Francisco residents suffered energy poverty where monthly household summer electric bills averaged around $136. But up to 15% of households in some Central Valley counties experienced high energy poverty, where, for example, my hometown, the average summer bill was $534. California's residential electric rates in 2014 were 41% higher than the national average. Rates are expected to increase by 47% by 2030, and that's under our current policies. If we increase our renewable portfolio standard by, to 50%, rates are estimated to be increased by additional 9 to 23%. Therefore, SB 350's electricity price hikes will push many Californians, many more Californians, into the energy poverty. This burden will especially fall very hard on the Central Valley residents who are already forced to pay three to four more times electricity in electricity than the coastal residents. I urge a no vote. Thank you, sir. Any further discussion or debate? Seeing none. Mr. Pro Tem, would you like to close? Thank you very much, uh, Madam President and colleagues. Thank you very much, and I much appreciate uh, the oppositional uh, arguments uh, against SB 350. Uh, I think all of us, Democrats and Republicans alike, want the very best for our communities, for our constituents that we represent, uh, for our families. We want better jobs. We want uh, clean and safe neighborhoods. We want to breathe clean air and drink clean water. We want the same thing. And uh, uh, I'm elated that we collectively work very hard uh, to move an agenda uh, that will hopefully deliver real results to the constituents that we represent. Now, Houston, Texas is the fossil fuel capital, uh, if not the world, at least the United States of America. And I want to lay out a statistical fact uh, that cannot be disputed. The state of Texas, whether you live in Houston or Dallas, San Antonio, Brownsville, the Houston uh, state of Texas, as a ratepayer, you pay higher utility bills than you do in the state of California. That's a fact. California nationwide, nationwide is the fourth lowest per capita use, lowest bills in America. Why is that? Because we often hear about the argument of utility rates and utility bills for individual rate payers, our residents. Because what our residents understand is when they open up that envelope, what they pay out of pocket, what comes out of their hard earned earnings that they have to pay on a monthly basis to turn the lights on, to turn the lights off, to cool the rooms, to heat the rooms. We're the fourth lowest in the country. Why? because we have moved forward with intentionality from this legislative body, the most progressive and far-reaching energy efficiency goals in the nation. We have actually, with a state of 40 million, 40 million residents, we actually use less per capita energy than any other state in the country. So if you live in Texas or Louisiana, your bills are much higher and you pay much more money out of pocket than you do in the state of California. That's not room for interpretation because that's very clear. The data is there. 
Now, relatively speaking, for certain regions within the state of California, you may pay more. Coastal region, you use less energy. If you live in the Central Valley, for example, San Joaquin Valley, it gets very hot and it also gets very cold. So your energy consumption is much more, unquestionably. So relatively speaking to other regions in the state of California, your bills may be higher, no doubt about it. You have different weather patterns. But as a whole, in the aggregate, we pay among the lowest in the country. Now, why do we push forward with these far-reaching progressive initiatives? Why? Because solar as well as wind have reached parity, or either have reached parity or actually are less expensive than traditional fossil fuels. We are on the verge of moving on to a new economy of tomorrow. Back in 2002, then State Senator Brian Schur, Palo Alto, Stanford University professor, moved forward with the first RPS, 20% for the state of California. Then a few years later, back in 2010, fast forward eight years, then State Senator Joe Simidian, also from Palo Alto, 33% renewal portfolio standard. And here we are in 2015, on the verge of accomplishing something that's truly historic, 50% renewable portfolio standard, knowing that solar and wind and other renewables are either at parity or in fact less expensive. It is the innovative spirit of who we are as Californians, as we push the envelope because we desire more, because we dream big, because we want to move big and bold ideas that benefit all individuals. That's why we need to make sure that we democratize our climate change policies. Reference was made to electrical vehicles and transportation electrification. No doubt, if you have the financial wherewithal to purchase a Tesla, well, that's a small minority, a small percentage of Californians. But in this legislation in 350, we have the ability to democratize the process where we'll have electrical charging stations throughout the state of California irrespective of your zip code, irrespective of the color of your skin or your socioeconomic strata. So then we can really metastasize the accessibility of electrical vehicles or electrical hybrid plug-in vehicles. This is who we are as innovators. This is who we are as dreamers. No politician, Democrat or Republican, says, hey, I got an idea. It's big and it's bold. I'm gonna move a piece of legislation that's gonna raise gas prices, and in fact, is gonna raise utility rates on everyone else. I think that's called political suicide. No politician does that. You have to do a lot of deep research. Deal with scientists. Deal with different types of methodology to make sure, can we reach these goals? Can we verify them? Can we quantify them? Can we actually measure less kilowatts hours can we measure carbon, GHG, CO2 that's never been manufactured because we re reduce our energy load and therefore we have more money in our pocket? These are the energy efficiency policies because of this progressive legislative body that has unleashed a world of innovation that the rest of the country as well as the world adopts to. Reference, let's go back 2002. Then Assemblywoman. Ram Pavley, move forward the California car standards. 15 years ago, if you purchase a Ford F-150 truck, depending if it was a V8 or V6, you got about 50 miles MPG. Today, in 2015, if you buy a Ford F-150 truck, you get 29 miles MPG highway. That's double the mileage on the same tank of gasoline. That came forth because of the policies moved here back in 2002. And what happened four years ago, 2011, President Barack Obama adopted the California car standards and nationalized them. So if you live in Kern County, Tulare or Kings or LA County or San Francisco, whether you're Republican or a Democrat, or you decline the state or agnostic altogether, who doesn't want to drive their pickup truck, it doesn't have to be a plug-in electrical vehicle, it doesn't have to be a ZEV, it can be a fossil fuel car, who doesn't want to drive your car farther? 
and pollute less and get much more efficiency. In the reddest of states, Alabama or Georgia or South Carolina, if you buy a car there, those are the California national standards. And this is the innovation that we unleash on this Senate floor, these big ideas, bold ideas. Let me reiterate a couple things. We got off ramps on this measure. We got off ramps for all of our utilities, POUs, public owned utilities, as well as our IOUs, investor owned utilities. The off ramps are the following. If clean power is too expensive, if it doesn't fit the utility portfolio, if you have grid issues, or if you have actually increased rates, you have an off ramp to seek a waiver and bail out. The last RPS had the, have, has those off ramps. In the last 14 years, not one single IOU through the PUC or one single MOU through the CEC, California Energy Commission, have asked for a waiver because they have reached far. And as a result, our rates have decreased steadily. This is what we want for our rate payers, for our constituents, for our consumers. Let's clean, breathe, let's breathe in clean air. Let's create a new economy of tomorrow. Let's create jobs that are real, that are tangible, that can't be outsourced or offshored elsewhere. Jobs for Californians. This is the future. Because an energy built on fossil fuels or a future built on fossil fuels is quite simply a future built on shifting stands, shifting sands. So that's why I asked my colleagues to reach, to reach. Let's reach for the stars, but let's be realistic. Let's measure, let's quantify, let's verify, let's have the off ramps. If clean energy all of a sudden becomes way too cost prohibitive, you have an off ramp to exit. So we make sure the cost is not pushed on to the consumer. Let's reach. Lastly, colleagues, I do want to thank the many public health advocates, the climate scientists, and the staff who have, helped, who have helped craft this measure and get it to this point. I want to specifically thank Nancy McFadden, as well as Dana Williamson from the governor's office, Arnie Sowell, as well as Catalina Hayes Bautista from the speaker's office, and of course, Kip Lipper of my office for liberalizing this measure. I also want to thank my three partners in this effort, Speaker Atkins, Governor Jerry Brown, and of course, Senator Fran Pavley. Senator Fran Pavley, the architect, what then Speaker Emeritus Fabian Nunez of AB32, who set forth the pathway for the California Clean Standards. And all of us who are showing the rest of the world that we can in fact decarbonize our economy, that we can delink carbon from GDP it is not by mistake that we are the eighth largest economy in the world. In fact, we have added 462,000 jobs in 2014, more than any other state in the union, 462,000 jobs. And that's coming off the worst economic recession since 1929, not because of climate change policies, but rather because of the debacle and the fallout of the housing crisis, of the housing market and the subprime loans. And we made devastating cuts that were very painful. But it wasn't because of our climate change policies. And here we are today, the eighth largest economy in the entire world. The proof is in the pudding. The data is there. I asked my colleagues to reach. This is something that we can do together historically. We can move forward, set the path, and show the world how it's done. Madam Speaker, Madam uh, uh, President, I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Allen? Aye. Aye. Anderson? No. No. Bates? No. Bell? Aye. Aye. Berryhill? No. Block? Aye. Aye. Canella? No. De Leon? Aye. Fuller? Gaines? No. Gaggioni? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hall? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. Hertzberg? I Hill, I Wesso, I Huff, No Jackson, I Lada, I Leno, I Leva, I Lou, I McGuire, I Mendoza, I Mitchell, I Morning, Morlock, No Morel, No Win, 
No. Nielsen? No. Pan? Aye. Aye. Pavley? Aye. Roth? Aye. Aye. Runner? No. no. Stone? No. Vidak? No. No. Wachowski? Aye. Aye. Wolk? Aye. Wolk? Aye. Call the absent members. Monning? Aye. Fuller? No. no. Ayes 26, noes 14. The assembly amendments are concurred in. Colleagues, moving on to file item 107, SB 548. Senator De Leon. Mr. Secretary, please read. Senate Bill 548 by Senator De Leon, an act to child care. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, colleagues, I ask for your concurrence in the Assembly amendments to SB 548, the Raising Child Care Quality Act. With these, uh, with these amendments, SB 548 will improve subsidized child care by establishing upfront training for family child care providers. The amendments also remove the provisions related to collective bargaining as well as a study. I respectfully ask for, and I vote. Any discussion or debate? Any discussion or debate? Mr. Secretary, call the roll. Allen? Aye. aye. Anderson? No. no Bates? No. no Bell? Aye. Barry Hill? No. no Block? Aye. aye. Canella? No. De Leon? Aye. aye. Fuller? No. no Gaines? No. no. Galgiani? I Glazer, I Hall, I Hancock, I Hernandez, I Hertzberg, I Hill, I Hueso, I Huff, No Jackson, I Lada, I Leno, I Leva, I Lou, I McGuire, I Mendoza, I Mitchell, I Monning, I Morlock, No Morell, No Wynn, No Nilsson, No Pan. I Pavley, I Roth, I Runner, no Stone, no Fidak, no Wykowski, I Wolk, Wolk I. Call the absent members. Ayes 26, noes 14. The assembly amendments are concurred on, are concurred in. 